On today's Locked on Jayhawks, we preview Kansas' first round matchup with the Samford Bulldogs should they be on upset alert. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. You can give me a follow at D Johnson Radio on Twitter, and you can tune in to any show you get with Locked on Jayhawks anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day, and thank you to the everydayers out there tuning into each and every episode. We had some content with Nick Schwert uh, talking about who's the most important player for KU this week. Uh, which did not get abrupted by the Kevin McCuller news. We had an episode on that. We had some KU Women's content and plenty more. Today's show, we're going to be breaking down, giving you a preview of Kansas Samford. Should the Jayhawks be on upset alert, especially without Kevin McCuller? First, this episode of Locked on Jayhawks is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Kansas Sanford, it is the late game on Thursday night playing in Salt Lake City. So, you know, two hours earlier there kind of makes sense. Uh, story number one here is, I guess, just in general, start of a new season. It's NCAA tournament season, baby. Like, that's great. I love the tournament. Um, obviously, whenever your team loses it, you go in maybe a funk for a few hours. But then, you know, hopefully you shake that off and you get back into the tournament because it is such a great event overall, no matter what happens, even though it is more fun objectively when your team does go a little bit further and everything. But I think the new season part of it, you know, maybe that's something that can matter a little bit more this year for Kansas and that, you know, a lot of times the tournament can be the reward. It can be an extension to a great season for Kansas. This year, it's more of like a start over and that you didn't live up to expectations the regular season. You know, you had some injuries, you had some things you had to deal with. Uh, you can start anew, right? You make an elite eight run. All of a sudden, some of that stuff is kind of forgotten a little bit if you can do just that. Unfortunately, though, one of the big storylines in this one is no Kevin McCuller. It was announced earlier this week with Bill Self that he is going to be out. He later posted on social media, on Twitter, uh, about the injury and that, you know, in discussing with everyone that that wasn't the case. Certainly Bill Self's words didn't sound as agreeable as the tweet from Kevin McCuller. But whatever you think, whatever side you're kind of on there, point being, Kevin McCuller is not playing in the NCAA tournament. And that's a huge loss because Kevin McCuller is a very good basketball player. He's somebody who's probably going to be, you know, an early second round pick in the NBA draft. I think he was 37th on the athletics latest mock draft. Um, So he's going to be a future NBA player. He's an All-American this year. He's one of your best scorers, one of your best rebounders, one of your best ball handlers, one of your best passers, one of your best defenders. He just does a little bit of everything. So to not have that guy, not just for this game, but moving forward in the tournament, if you do get by Stanford, that is obviously a huge loss. The good news, though, is that Hunter Dickinson is supposed to be back. The other good news is that Bill Self is here for the NCAA tournament after not being there last year. So those are both things that Hunter gives you a boost from what you didn't have last week, and Bill Self gives you a boost from what you didn't have a year ago. And you had the week off in between. We know Bill Self has done excellent in the first games of the week where you have that long week off to prep and get ready for the game. And it's an even longer prep for KU since they last played on Wednesday, gave them more time to maybe have fresh legs for some of the players and for Hunter to try to get fully healthy. And maybe that'll help for Johnny Furphy, right? Because he's trying to break out of a slump coming into this game Furphy who has been excellent since entering the starting lineup maybe hitting a bit of that freshman wall later in the season but because he started later in the season maybe the wall came later in the season but over his last five games Johnny Furphy is only averaging seven points per game on 10 of 37 shooting and three of 19 that is under 20 percent from three-point range Johnny Furphy is still a good player it's just we see this all the time happen with freshmen the question now becomes can he shake off the freshman wall when the lights are the brightest in the NCAA tournament. And can he make himself some money, right? Because if he does do that and he shakes it off and Kansas makes, you know, a surprise sweet 16 run or whatever it is, uh, maybe not surprise sweet 16, if it, you know, whatever, elite eight run, whatever it ends up being. And he plays really well as part of it. You know, then it really is going to be like, yeah, this dude's gone to the NBA. He might already be gone to the NBA regardless of what happens, but uh, certainly that would only add to uh, the draft stock against some of the better opponents. And from Kansas perspective, like, especially now without Kevin McCuller, you need more scoring, you need wing scoring and everything. Kansas can't advance far in the tournament without Johnny Furphy figuring it back out and getting it back together. Another big storyline here is the impact of altitude. You know, this is something where um, Sanford is third in the country, according to Ken Palm and bench minutes. So they are a team that plays deep. They press. How is the altitude going to affect 
them with their press, right? Because it is tiring to press. Like, is it going to tire them out? Or is it going to tire KU out in the altitude where you have a thinner team, a team that doesn't play as many guys, guys are going to be playing longer minutes. You also have the longer TV timeouts, so that helps. But, you know, that becomes a question that could affect either side, honestly, with the altitude. Then you have the battle of height is a cool storyline. Kansas, that's a big edge for them. Sixth in the country in average height, though I'd imagine that goes down a little bit without Kevin McCuller because instead of playing like a six foot six, six foot seven Kevin McCuller, you're playing either like a, you know, six foot, I don't know what he's, what is Timberlake listed at? Six foot three or whatever, uh, Nick Timberlake or like a six foot two, uh, Marco Jackson, whatever it ends up being. But still, Samford is 349th in height. Kansas is sixth. Sometimes basketball can be a simple game. Sometimes height does matter. Look at Zach Eady, back-to-back national player of the year, basically. I'm assuming he's going to win it this year. Um, height doesn't tend to matter in basketball, turns out, right? Uh, so the Sanford Scouting Report, they are 29-5 and on the season. They went 15-3 and in the Southern Conference, which ran is the 13th best conference on Ken Palm. So this isn't just like they won, you know, obviously it's a mid-major. It's not the Big 12 or the Big East or anything, but it, it's better on the end of mid-major conferences. It was about in line with like what the West Coast Conference was. Uh, they played just two games, though, against top 100 opponents, and they did not go well for Samford. 53-point loss to Purdue and a 10-point loss at VCU. Now, the teams who were ranked between 101 and 150, so top 150 teams, they did go 8-1, and one, so they did beat a lot of teams that were on the fringe of being top 100, and their average margin of victory in those games was by 10 points. So they started to get it rolling in the back half of the season, and you know, showed that uh, maybe if they would have played a top 100 team later in the year, that they would have scored a, a couple wins along the way. What they do well, they play fast. Sixth in the country in average possession length on an overall strong shooting team and strong offense. They are seventh in the country in effective field goal percentage. They are eighth in the country in three-point percentage at 39.3%. And it comes on high volume. They call it Bucky Ball, which is the name of their head coach. And they're 20th in two-point percentage at 55.5%. They just score efficiently from all levels of the floor. They actually led their league and they were top 90 in the nation in getting to the foul line too. So they're able to, you know, rack up free throws in addition to being efficient shooting basketball defensively, not as good as what the offense is, but they do at least a couple things very well. Chaotic plays, forcing a ton of turnovers, and that comes from playing their press defense. They're 10th in the country in steal rate defensively. They are 16th in the country in turnover rate defense. They're also second in their league and top 100 in the country in block rate. Now, again, all these stats that we're listing here are a little bit different for them than maybe a school that is playing in a power five or a power six, whatever you want to call it in college basketball. Because, you know, if you're the number five team in the country in three-point percentage, but then all of a sudden you're playing big 12 teams every time, what does that number drop off to? And that's almost impossible to know because for some teams, it has a bigger drop off than others. Like there are some teams where it's like, yeah, we played in the Missouri Valley. We were 20th in three point percentage. And then we played all these good teams. We were still 20th in three point percentage. Other teams, like I remember Howard last year uh, when KU played them in the first round, then they did hit a decent amount of threes against KU on high volume, but it was below their season average in percentage. And they came in a really good three point shooting team. Same with like Northeastern a couple of years ago when Kansas spanked them in the first round in 2019. So uh, you do have to take some of these with a grain of salt a little bit. But the one thing with Samford that I feel like is a little bit different than like Northeastern and Howard. They are a very athletic team. They are a quick team and a fast team, maybe a little bit more so than those that maybe it translates a little bit better. So uh, keep that in mind, I guess. What they don't do well, rebounding. They are top 130 in the country in offensive rebounding rate, but that number in conference play dropped off to like middle of the pack, below average in league play. And on the defensive side, they've been a bad defensive rebounding team. 313th in the country in defensive rebounding rate. How much can Kansas take control of that will be interesting because the Jayhawks sit at just 291st in the country in offensive rebound rate, and Kevin McCuller is one of your better rebounders, so how does that affect things? Uh, the other things, though, with Samford, too many turnovers on offense. That's another weakness for them. 256th in turnover rate offensively and 309th in getting the ball stolen from them. So maybe look out for like DeWan Harris to, to rip the ball clean a couple times. And teams will get a lot of good looks against them if they do break the press and stay patient. If you're calm, if you're not having dumb turnovers, if you're able to handle the ball well and strongly and avoid them stealing the ball, you're going to get good shots off it because you're going to break the press and you're going to have numbers going your way. And so outside the top 130 
in a two point three point and effective field goal percentage defense for Samford, and they did not rank in the top five in any of those in conference only games. So uh, if you can break the press and hold on to the ball well, you're going to get good looks here if you're Kansas. Now the personnel: this is a very small backcourt, five foot eight, hundred forty pound Dallas Graziani, four points, two and a half assists, one and a half steals. This will be a common theme: forty one percent from three, uh, six foot, hundred sixty five pound Garrett Hicks. 6.6 points, 34% from three. And then six foot, 175 pound Ryland Jones, good off of ball screens, 9.4 points, 4.9 assists, 1.5 steals per game on 38% from three. Uh, they also use 6'2 Josh Holloway, 4.3 points, 2.1 assists, 27% from three. So he's not as much of the shooter as the other guys. Those guys eat up most of the minutes at the one and two. They're playing a lot of players. On the wing, six foot five Jaden Campbell. 11.1 points, 3.3 rebounds, great shooting splits, 54 from the field, 47 from three, 84 at the foul line. They've got six foot seven Nathan Johnson, 5.6 points on 39% from three, six foot five Lucas Walls, three over three points on 47% from three. They're lower stats, but when you add them all up on high efficiency, you can see why this becomes a uh, problem for a lot of their opponents in their conference. Uh, six foot five, AJ Staten McCray, 11.6 points, 4.6 rebounds, 1.6 steals, 42% from three. And then even uh, some six foot three, Chandler Leopard, who averages about three points per game on 47% from three. Then you have Jermaine Marshall, who's six foot six, 225. They'll play him some at the four, they'll play him some at the five. 10.9 points, 5.1 rebounds, 1.3 steals, over 50% from the floor, 36% from distance. He more plays on the wing but they will maybe throw a handful of minutes with him at the five beyond that though, at center, their best player is six foot nine, 225 pound a core, a core who uh, averages 15.8 points, 6.1 rebounds and 1.8 blocks per game. He does all that in just 22 minutes per game on 60% from the floor, 45% from three and 72% at the foul line. Great player has had to deal with some foul trouble in key games this year. So maybe that's something KU can get him into. And then uh, they do have some size they can bring off the bench. 6'11", 247 pound freshman Riley Alpins, all in Spock. Uh, over five points, over three rebounds, and seven foot, 240 pound senior Zach Loveday could get a handful of minutes too to give them uh, extra bodies in there. Uh, let's continue on matchups of the game. What could determine this one? Player matchups and Hawks to soar on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The Auburn Tigers can only be described as a pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch and have really created a lane for themselves after claiming the top spot in the SEC tournament. As they knocked off the Florida Gators in the tournament championship of the SEC, they're set to make a run now in the NCAA tournament. Take the Nissan Rogue. Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. We're also brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. You can make your own same game parlay for the KU Sanford game. We're going to give you some Hawks to soar KU players we think are going to have good games. Maybe you can use some of those to put together your same game parlay. Do whatever you want. Just do it responsibly. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. FanDuel, official sports book of the Locked On Network. On our matchups of the game between Kansas and Samford, number one, Kansas guarding Bucky Ball, which basically means Kansas guarding the three ball. You know, it's kind of funny, like going into the idea, we've, we've talked a lot about the three-point defense and that Kansas hasn't been a good three-point defense. Um, they don't do great guarding, you know, ball screens and getting out to guys. But as much as Kansas has left too many guys open too often, there is still an element of there's still a lot of guys hitting tough shots on the occasions that they do actually play good three-point defense. And uh, teams are actually shooting a higher percentage on jump shots that are guarded than they are unguarded against KU. So that's just kind of a weird thing. But Sanford will take advantage of bad three-point defense, which we certainly have seen a lot of uh, over the course of the season for KU. All five, though, of Furman of uh, Sanford's losses this year saw, saw them shoot below 34% from three-point range. 
Um, and in fact, when they shot below 34% from three, Sanford was just five and five compared to 24 and 0 when they shoot 34% or better from downtown. They shoot a high volume. And that's obviously been a struggle for the KU defense so far this year. You look at so many games, the BYU game, which they lost, the Kentucky game, which they won, but uh, that obviously could have gone the other way and so many others along the way, whether it was teams who didn't shoot great from three and did against Kansas or whatever. So if honestly, like if, if Sanford goes nine of 25 from three, that'd be 36% on solid volume. Even that, like, yeah, I know that's above that 34% mark, but that might be actually a, an okay mark you can live with if you're Kansas, but you just can't get scorched from the outside. You don't want to look up there and see Sanford is, you know, all of a sudden 13 of 30 or something like that from three. And it's like, well, Kansas is only uh, three of 15. Good luck catching up in the math department there. Number two is Kansas stealing extra possessions on the boards. Defensively, KU has been good. Um, in terms of defensive rebound rate, but the long rebounds on the threes make it kind of a different challenge. So that's something that everybody has to get involved. The guards need to do a good, uh, good job rebounding here for Kansas. But on the offensive side of the ball, Kansas is not a great three-point shooting team, and they've not been a good offensive rebounding team. They rank near 300 in the country. But Sanford has not been a good uh, defensive rebounding team. And for Kansas to be a more efficient offense, you got to start getting extra shots. And when you get offensive rebounds, you're not just getting extra shots. You're getting extra high efficiency looks. Like how often do you see a guy hit a wide open three after an offensive rebound? Or how often do you get an offensive rebound? And then, Oh, Hey, look, I'm right at the basket. I can just lay it in. Like that is such an efficient way to help boon your offense. And that's something that like Roy Williams excelled at in his time at, at Kansas and North Carolina. Uh, but in all five of Samford's losses, the opponent grabbed at least 33%. So about one in every three of their misses, including over a 40% offensive rebound rate from losses to VCU and Wofford. For what it's worth, Kansas has only cleared that 33% offensive rebound rate just six times. That's not a lot. They are 6-0, though, when they can do it. So put a little extra emphasis on uh, getting the offensive boards, but it's going to have to be like the traditional bigs because you're still going to want the guards to run back to get out and guard the transition threes that Samford will launch up. Number three is taking care of the basketball. Samford presses. They're in the 97th percentile in the country for steal rate, and that leads to, at times, if you can break it, open shots and transition threes at a high rate um, for them uh, in, in addition to you. Like you, if you can break it, are going to get open looks. For them, when they get the steal, they're going to lead that to open looks because they're going to have numbers after the steal. And they average 18.6 points off of turnovers per game, which puts them in the 99th percentile per CBB analytics. So if you just avoid turning the ball over, boom, you're cutting the head off a lot of their offense and you're getting yourself better looks more often. Kansas is just two and four this year against teams with a top 25 turnover rate defense. And certainly that's what Sanford is at this point in time. One thing that I find interesting on Synergy. So um, against the press, this is according to Synergy, they faced 150 possessions of the press. Kansas is averaging only 0.84 points per possession, which ranks only in the 29th percentile of the country according to Synergy, in scoring against the press. Now, 150 possessions isn't a lot. Like, out of comparison, Kansas has almost 2,500 total possessions this year. That's still, like, enough where it's like, that's not a good sign. Only 29th percentile in scoring against transition. But you've had the whole week to practice for it this time, so it's a little bit different. A big game for Dewan Harris, though, who did play well in the two NCAA tournament games last year outside of the 10-second call. Big game for your ball handlers, which you're without one less with Kevin McCuller. So, I mean, Dewan El Marco as a young freshman, got to step up in this game. Number four is protecting the rim. It's so easy to get caught up with the three-point shooting that you overhelp or overemphasize. And I, number one, I mean, you you got to stop the same for threes. I'm not saying – you know, to go counter of that, I'm just saying you still have to be cognizant that you can't overdo it from three because Samford is in the 96th percentile in at the rim field goal attempt percentage. So as much as they shoot a lot of threes, they get a lot of shots at the rim too. They're not really taking mid-range shots and they shoot at the rim at about a 63% clip. That's above average. That's up to 66% their last 10 games, albeit against not great competition. So they're, they're solid enough there, but they shoot them a lot and then they shoot a lot of threes. Um, so, so a lot of those are going to come in transition. A lot of those are going to come off steals where they're going to get an easy layup and that kind of boons some of those numbers too, but you still have to respect the driving lanes. And if you overemphasize the three, you're still going to get beat to the basket. So, uh, it, it certainly is something that you have to be very careful on the defensive end and, and know what you're doing. Know your scouting reports. Player matchup here is Hunter Dickinson versus Acor Acor. Acor Acor is 6'9", 225. 
Uh, Hunter Dickinson should be able to bury him in the post at 7 2, like 265. Acor, Acor, honestly, you know, when you watch him play, I don't even know if he is 225 pounds, to be completely honest. Like, he is, he's pretty rail thin, you know, like Hunter Dickinson should be able to power him down in the post and get whatever he wants on the offensive end. The question becomes here can Hunter Dickinson defend him when Acor, Acor can use his speed to maybe get him on a, a rim run or something? and or is stretching they're going to run a lot of pick and pops with acor acor could he have a game where he goes like three or four from three he's 45 percent from three he only averages you know around two three pointers per game but i'd imagine this will be a game where they're saying hey you're gonna get four or five threes off in this game so hit three of them or something like that right so that becomes a very interesting matchup but one thing with acor acor he has had a couple games um against the better teams they played like in the purdue game they were able to kind of take him away with with zach Eady. In the VCU game, he fouled out in 14 minutes, and he's had some other games against some of their top 150 opponents where he's gotten in foul trouble. I, I think if you're Bill Self, you go early and often to Hunter Dickinson on offense, A, because that should be an advantage for you, but B, if you can get this guy in foul trouble, it certainly changes the way they want to play with their most dynamic player on the offensive side of the ball. All right, we're going to continue on with our Hawks to soar KU players we think can stick out on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That's included with us right here with the Locked On Network, most of the big pro leagues and college conferences. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. Plus, they've got great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on Fire TV. Hawks to soar for KU. Number one, I'm going to go KJ Adams. In a game where Kansas was shorthanded, KJ Adams showed so much fight and grit and hustle and had a big game against Cincinnati. You're back to playing with two big basketballs, so the lanes aren't quite as much there with Hunter Dickinson there for KJ. But uh, Nathan Johnson, who's the main foreman for them, even though they play so many different guys all across the lineup, uh, Nathan Johnson actually has a negative defensive BPR rating on Evan Miyakawa's website. So that should be an advantage for Kevin McCuller here. They have smaller guards to be able to slice through if they get switched on to you that you should be able to back them down. And as much attention as Hunter Dickinson is going to get, I think this is one of those games where KJ could really impact when Hunter has the ball in the post, he's cutting to the rim. And like I said, um, Kansas hasn't been a good offensive rebounding team, but they're a bad defensive rebounding team. That's a way you could make up some, some of the math problem with the threes in a game like this. There's no reason KJ can't be a great offensive rebounder. Have one of those games where you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 rebounds and have three or four of them on the offensive glass. So I'm going to go with KJ as a hawk to soar here. Um, I would say Hunter Dickinson on offense. On defense, I think it's a tough matchup for him. But on offense, I think it's a great matchup for Hunter. And then you know what? Let's go with Johnny Furphy, man. Uh, if KU breaks the press with the ball handling, you're going to get some guys in the corner and on the wing that are open for three after you break the press and then you drive into the lane and kick out, Furphy's going to be one of those recipients. Will he hit the shots? That becomes the question, but he's going to get the opportunities. Also, I should mention, and this is part of the reason why, what I just said with breaking the press, Samford gives up a ton of corner threes. They are bottom fifth percentile in the country in preventing those shots. And for a Kansas team that this season is, this according to Synergy, they are in the 94th percentile at unguarded shots versus only being in the third percentile in guarded shots, meaning that they don't have enough guys who can make tough shots and create off the bounce, you are going to have some opportunity to get some unguarded shots in this game when you break the press, as long as you can do that consistently. I mean, a lot, like I said, is on Dewan and Omarco and whoever's going to be handling the ball, maybe some Jamari McDowell in this game. And if they can, Furphy is going to have an opportunity to take advantage with some corner threes in this one. All right, that'll do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. We'll recap whatever happens in the game. Hopefully more games to come for KU at this point in time of the year. But we'll be back whatever happens, I guess, late on your Thursday night into your Friday morning. This has been Locked on Jayhawks. Make sure you subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page. See you next time with LOJ.